Here is Julia Fenderson to introduce Fern Grimsley. Thank you, Jeff. I'm grateful that I have the honor to present Fern Grimsley today, and I'm happy for some other reasons, too. I wanted the opportunity to really thank Vern and his crew for the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, work that we'd all like to be doing, but I'm sure I don't have a silver tongue or a oratory that uh, Vern possesses and some of the others that speak on the family of God. So those of us, when we received the book, felt like getting on the housetops and shouting the good news of the book. I think you've all shared that feeling, haven't you? That when you first got the book, you just felt like you must rush out and tell everyone the good news. Well, maybe all of us aren't able to do that, so we move the chairs and do the menial things that, and help people in every possible way we can who can do those things. And I think Vern and his crew today showed how well they exemplify uh, people who are really getting things done in disseminating the teachings of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. We first met Vern and Nancy six years ago, just this month, at the Hilton in San Francisco when we were organizing a little Urantia study group there. And that was when he was first speaking on KFAX, was it, Vern? And we were so happy to see Vern and his devoted and capable wife, Nancy, uh, and to know about their work there. Since that time, their work has just burgeoned. I think they're covering over a third of the United States now with a radio broadcast. And uh, he's president, Vern is president of the Family of God Foundation, and he's met their wonderful crew today. They are, uh, the Family of God Foundation is a nonprofit, non-denominational, tax-exempt foundation proclaiming the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Vern has an enviable background. I could go on for a couple of hours on the background, I think, of accomplishments from his youth on. But I want, I know how much you want to hear him speak, so I won't take that time. He uh, is, was graduated from the University of Kansas with distinction, Phi Beta Kappa. He were, his majors were in philosophy and uh, psychology. He has done postgraduate study at the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. For the past several years, Vern has pursued a rigorous course of study designed to prepare him for the present challenging task. Vern and his devoted and dedicated wife, Nancy, have dedicated the rest of their lives to disseminating the truths that are in this book. In my opinion, Vern and Nancy and their foundation are, uh, represent sort of a John the Baptist situation for the Urantia book. It's my opinion that they're sort of the ones who go before the widespread dissemination of the teachings of the book. They do, they talk about the book, quote it, and give all the truths. In fact, they've had letters that from people they didn't know that said, ah, oh, we know where you're getting your philosophy. It's from the Urantia book <laughs> when they broadcast. So they're disseminating the teachings, and I uh, always think of them as John the Baptist situation, the one to go before the widespread, worldwide uh, knowledge of the Urantia book. The topic that Vern has selected for today concerns the major mission of the book, which is to proclaim the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And as Jesus himself quoted, as he talked to his followers, he said, the Father sent me and so send I you. Very. Thank you. Earlier today, Scott Forsyth told me he wanted me to begin my talk tonight promptly at 8.30. I said, I'll try, but why? He said, that's when the bionic man comes on. <laughs> He said he always watches it, and he didn't want to miss anything important. <laughs> I had a long-distance phone call from Solano Beach. Richard Keeler there has a study group. About a month ago, he was asking me what, in my opinion, 
were the important elements of public speaking. And I thought, and I said, I think one of the most important things is diction, enunciation, elocution. And I reminded him of the ancient Greek orator Demosthenes, who used to put small pebbles in his mouth and then stand out on the seashore and rehearse his orations. I won't say what happened, but last week Rich was working on a talk in his living room, <laughs> sneezed and broke three windows in a ceramic vase. <laughs> but I digress. Will Durant, the historian, wrote in his book, The Lessons of History, that the great issue of our time is not communism versus capitalism, not East versus West, Europe versus America. The great issue of our time is whether man can bear to live without God. Arnold Toynbee wrote in volume 12 of his monumental world history that the great need of civilization was for a new age of religion. H.G. Wells wrote at the conclusion of his outline of history that there were eight necessities for creating world peace, and the first one of those he listed was, quote, a new age of religion. Charles Beard, the historian, was once asked what he'd learned from his study of history, and he said that among other things he'd learned, the mills of God grind exceeding slowly, but they grind exceeding fine, and that when it is darkest, the stars come out. Channing Pollock wrote that once he was at Columbia University, having lunch with some members from the history faculty. And they overheard a woman at a nearby table say to a companion of hers, the world's in a terrible state of affairs, but there's nothing one person can do. To which one of the historians leaned over and said, should we remind her that everything of real importance which has ever been done on this planet has been begun by one man or one woman. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, that properly considered there's no such thing as history, there's only biography, the story of individual lives and their individual determinations. We can blueprint a better world with pen and ink, but we must construct a better world with men and women. And for that, we must have better men and women. The need is not simply external environmental change, but inward transformation. Our task is not just to take the people out of their problems, but to take the problems out of the people, to teach inward mastery and transformation of the inner life. As Thomas Carlyle said, if you make yourself an honest man, you can at least be certain there's one less rascal in the world. <laughs> Historians refer to the Industrial Revolution, which means that before the year 1730, four out of every five people on earth were making their livings in agriculture. But by 200 years later, four out of every five people on earth in those areas touched by the Industrial Revolution were making their livings not in agriculture, but in industry. A tremendous historic transition. And yet we've had now an industrial revolution. We've had a scientific revolution. We've had cultural awakenings. The urgent need now is for a spiritual renaissance. From the ancient Assyrians, humankind learned the building of libraries and postal systems. From the Babylonians, the knowledge of astronomy and the molding of clay bricks. From the Phoenicians, we learned a written alphabet. From the Persians, international coinage. From the ancient Greeks, humankind learned music, drama, architecture, philosophy. From the Romans, the making of bridges, roads, and laws. But we've not yet learned the ways of righteousness and peace, the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God. And until we learn that, the rest that we have learned will matter very little. A person looks around at a troubled world and thinks, but what chance is there for religious unity? All these different religions have their own theologies, and some of them seem to be at odds with each other. And some historians have said most of the wars ever fought have been religious wars. What hope is there? Is truth one, or is it many? Because the religions and the theologies argue so much. This brings to mind the perpetual grammatical debate over the word trousers. Is the word trousers singular or plural? To which the philosophically inclined person might reply that trousers are singular at the top and plural at the bottom. <laughs> so with truth. As we perceive truth here below and argue and dispute about it, it seems multiplex, but ultimately truth is unified in God. And just as the plant biologists know, the strongest strains of hybrids are composed of drawing the strong strains from several different varieties of plants, several different kinds, so the religion of the future is going to draw and derive its insights from many of the world's great living religions. But it isn't enough that we get these religious people together. There has to be a spirit of unity and love. It wouldn't be enough for us to come together physically. We'd have to have unity of spirit. 
There's far too much religious hatred, religious persecution, religious intolerance, and I'm against it. <laughs> we have to have a spirit of unity because we're spiritual creatures. William James, the psychologist, said most of us use only 10% of our brain capacity in a lifetime. Physiologists say most of us are shallow breathers and we use only about a third of our lung expansion capacity. If we use as little as 10% of our mental potential and as little as a third of our lung capacity, imagine how little of our spiritual possibilities most of us use. It's as if we were living in one tiny broom closet of a great 1,000 room mansion and so much was waiting there to be explored. I'm from Finney County, Kansas, originally, and I remember talking one time with a woman who was in her 80s and who told me she never in her life had been outside of Finney County, Kansas. The more I've reflected upon it, you may not have had that bad an idea, but <laughs> is there not an impulse toward spiritual exploration just as there's an impulse toward geographic exploration, learning new things? But this must be balanced. If your religion is all intellect, you'll dry up. If your religion is all emotion, you'll blow up. As Blaise Pascal said, the heart has its reasons which reason cannot know. The great scientist, physicist Edward Teller was once asked if there's anything science is absolutely certain about. And he said, yes, science is absolutely certain that absolutely nothing can exceed the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, maybe. <laughs> Scientifically, intellectually, we have our doubts, things we don't know. But there's a strange sense of spiritual security and spiritual certitude in the finding and knowing of God, which nothing can touch, which is real, even if we don't understand it. I don't understand how a zipper works. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and give white milk, for that matter. <laughs> but I can eat ice cream. Because there's more to us than contained between our haircuts and our toenails. More than what we weigh when we step on the doctor's scale. There's a spiritual dimension as well. The sense of a whole cosmic reason for being here. That we can really celebrate that. And be glad for it and know that we have a destiny. And just as a bee goes from flower to flower gathering nectar, we are destined one day to voyage from star to star gathering light. Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, said, God is truth and light is his shadow. And Augustine said, O oh God, thou hast made us for thyself, and the heart of man is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Because too much of the religion of the past has been based on fear, you know, and guilt, and people are turned off by that. Nothing but fear and guilt. It's when you're driving down the freeway, 10 miles over the speed limit, between two diesel semis, and behind a moving van, on a rainy midnight, with your seat belt unbuckled, and no tread on the tires. And all of a sudden, the rear doors of the moving van come flying open, and a grand piano with a four-poster bed strapped to it rolls out on the freeway. So at a time like that, a person learns to pray. <laughs> the origin of much evolutionary religion, fear and guilt, but the religion of the future is going to be based primarily on faith and love, not centering on this negativity. There was an elderly woman who used to sit out on her front porch, rocking back and forth, and she'd be reading the Bible, and she'd say to herself, the troubles of this world, the troubles of this world, and she was always turning to the sad parts of the Bible and reading about the prince of darkness and where the moon was going to drip blood. <laughs> and plagues of frogs and plagues of locusts. And wars and rumors of wars. And she was always unhappy. And one day her little grandson came up to her and said, Grandmother, you're always reading the Bible, but you're always unhappy. And she says, well, I read in this Bible that in this life we're going to have trouble and we're going to have tribulation. And she said, I don't care what you may say, I mean to tribulate. <laughs> Fear, guilt. Somebody says they don't have anything to contribute. The forest would be quite still if no birds sang but those that sang the best. Everyone has something to contribute. And it will be work. It will be hard. Some people, when there's a piano to be moved, they want to carry the stool. 
But to bring this spiritual awakening is going to require hard thinking, hard work, genuine, difficult endeavor, but it is going to be part of changing the world. And that's the exciting thing about it. You can pick up a newspaper today and read that newspaper, and that which makes headlines is on the front page, but that which makes history is very often on the back page or not even in the newspaper at all. And so if you and I tonight come to new resolutions and new decisions spiritually about what we want to do with our time and our energy and our talents for God, ultimately for God, that won't even be on the back page of any newspaper. But it will make a difference on this planet, which is tremendous. And I, for one, would rather die for a cause which will one day triumph than to triumph with a cause which will one day die. And this cause is destined to triumph.